But so um, Richard, uh, Deborah, Wes and Bobby, who is listening in, but we can't we can't see you. Um, thank you so much for being part of this conversation. So just I just want to frame the conversation for a moment. And we're not going to we haven't really got a sense of exactly where it's going to go. We're, it's a little bit like we're going for a walk um, uh, around the Grange, which I've never been to or around the cathedral, which um, which uh, Deborah and Wes, I think, have never been to. So we're kind of walking around each other's spaces and just having a little bit of an explore about how they might speak to each other and how our different histories might speak to each other and how we might be able to, uh, I hope, draw some strength or some inspiration or allow ourselves to be challenged a little bit by, uh, by the different histories that we've had. So I have no idea exactly where that's going to lead us to, but I'm really excited by the fact we've been able to come together. So just to kick off, just to say that um, some of the things that have led to us being together, strangely, the things that have led to this creative conversation were, were both tragedies. We would not be speaking together this evening or this afternoon were it not for terrible things that had happened. So to start with um, the experience on September the 7th in 1940 um, with the lynching of Austin Calloway. And just to, just to pause on that, that harsh fact for a moment, um, because it feels hard just to move straight on from having just stated it. Um, uh, I'm guessing that um, people who, who look in on this recording will probably know something of the story, um, uh, that he was uh, pulled from jail by a mob of white people, um, I guess white men, um, uh, who forced the jailer to open his cell. Um, there was only one person protecting his cell, um, but the police uh, did not uh, do anything to prevent that taking of that young man from his cell. Uh, he was taken out into the countryside and the next morning uh, was found uh, bleeding to death from gunshot wounds to his hands, his arms and his head uh, on a rural road and died uh, a few hours later. Actually, for me to share that history feels almost impertinent and very poignant. Um, so I hope that, that, um, that you'll forgive me for anything inappropriate in the way that I've said that. The history that I bring close to that is that um, uh, a couple of months later, uh, on November the 14th, 1940, um, the uh, skies in Coventry were filled with the sound of Luftwaffe bombers uh, for some 10 or 11 hours dropping bombs on the city. At the end of that night, around 500 men, women and children had lost their lives, 20,000 homes were damaged or destroyed, uh, and uh, amongst the destroyed buildings was the, the old Coventry Cathedral, which went up in flames. And, uh, and the response of the city here to that destruction was to begin to explore questions of resurrection and reconciliation, which have led us on a bit of a journey from that day to this. And actually, strangely enough, perhaps, um, uh, at our annual patronal festival, the Feast of St. Michael and All Angels, just the other night, I was reflecting for a moment on the fact that actually our relationships as a city and as a cathedral with the people of Germany, because of the way that we uh, or my predecessors were able to respond to that act of destruction, strangely are almost closer than they would have been had the destruction not have happened. So it was an absolute tragedy, something which we deeply regret, but it has actually led to something which has come to inspire people and brought people together. So um, that's an important thing for us. And uh, it's something perhaps that we might return to in the, in the evening in our conversation. 
um, about how we can respond to violence and destruction and perhaps see something of a response to God um, or, an, a, a, or, or the discovery of the presence of Christ in the midst of that as well. I'm incredibly uh, privileged and grateful that we have a, an exhibition of photographs in the cathedral um, that Richard recorded of the gathering of soil from the site of that lynching. Um, and uh, deeply moved by the character of Richard's photographs, which somehow take us into the, the reality of that, of that um, encounter. And they're exhibited in a chapel in the cathedral, which has clear glass around it. And so, although it's quite difficult to see into from the outside because it's, uh, it's, on, it's on what we would call the first floor, and I think in the States you would call the second floor, um, uh, it's, uh, you, but you can see into the space. So you're kind of aware of it, particularly if you know what's being recorded in there from uh, around and outside. But um, as I heard the story and as I saw the photographs, I think I was led into an encounter with um, the tragedy that lay behind the, um, uh, behind the, the events that the photograph records, but also the journey that people have been on. So I guess I would like to come to you, Deborah, and just ask if you would, wouldn't mind just sharing with us a little bit of um, what it has meant for you to live out the story of the family of, of Austin and, and, and how that story was changed or affected by the, by the events that are recorded in, in Richard's photographs. Uh, thinking back uh, when I ran across uh, seeing his name as I was doing research in my family history, I had started in 2013 um, looking into my family history. No one had ever traced our history as to where we came from, who were some of our ancestors' name we may not have heard of. So I ran across in putting in Callaway just in the uh, Google search engine, I ran across Austin Calloway when I typed in African-American Calloways, LaGrange, Georgia, and Austin Calloway's name popped up. So that within itself was like, oh my God, you know, here's a 16 year old that's been lynched. Mm. And um, I asked around different family members, but my mom uh, that time was probably 82 or so. She had not heard of the lynching of Austin Calloway and LaGrange. And of course, most of the elderly in our family were deceased mm -hmm. at this time in 2013. So as I began to look further, um, it was just mind boggling to me that we had never heard of this lynching. So here we are 2017 well, 2015, I think, is when I came in contact with uh, Wes Edwards and Bobby Hart. And they started, um, Wes, with his group, of course, found this in a book. They were doing a reading, and they found the story in their research. And they began to research it. And so Bobby and Wes came to my mom's home and wanted to talk to her about it. So at this time is when we've really heard a little, a little, little bit more of Austin Calloway's lynching was from Bobby and Wes. They had began to do, dig into the background. So this is where I came in. And of course my mom being 82 didn't really want to get involved. Mm. She um, said, well, you just be the spokesperson. that will be okay. So this is how I came to be the spokesperson for our family in Austin. But when I think about Austin, as I began to do the research, you know, I found out he was actually born 1916. He was a 24 year old man. He was not a 16 year old juvenile. What we thought first, he was born 1916. So um, it was just um, overwhelming to see that he was murdered in such a way and you really now really um, we're still researching into it, trying to find the truth. And so that's been uh, hard within itself. 
to find the truth here in 2021. We're still doing research and still hoping that people will open up and talk with us about um, this young man. Thank you. So it's really so much of it is just about trying to um, help a story be heard. I'm really struck that there are no, so far as I know, no photographs of Austin. Is that right? That's correct. We were not able to find any photographs, but yeah. um, so far in our research, uh, we haven't found any photographs. And you think about he was born 1916 and most people that age, um, that may have been a friend of his, you know. Mm. Uh, we don't know friends, don't know the location. I know that at that time, the area in which he was living with his parents, we know that much. But um, I think it will eventually come to light because I believe in the power of prayer. And we, we always, as we would meet as a group to talk about it, Wes, Bobby, and others, mm. we would always pray about it, pray first, open up with prayer. And I think that's our answer. God mm. will reveal it. And can I ask, what do you pray for? Um, well, the night that we did the apology, uh, in before that night, leading up to the event uh, of that, I actually Ask God to please forgive him. I wow. ask for forgiveness for the ones that committed the murder. And I felt if my heart could stay focused on forgiveness, that um, and God truly knows your heart, I felt like he'll answer that prayer. That's amazing to hear and incredibly moving. And I guess that's probably a prayer that needs to keep being repeated because it's hard. It's exactly. Hard and so we work with the pastors. We started out working with the pastors, as Wes can and Bobby can tell you. We worked with the pastors group. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody at that particular time was on one accord. Mm -hmm. And where two or three gathered, touching and agreeing. Mm -hmm. So I felt like, um, mm -hmm. and at that time, we just wanted to get his story out there. When we were meeting to, to honor him, we were getting that story out there. Not only about Austin, but we found out there were others from LaGrange at that time, yeah. but we were really focused on him just at that particular time. Let, Wes, let's come to you as because of the way that Deborah's just talked about that. And so just tell me a little bit about what it's meant to you to be involved in this story and where you perhaps have seen God in it or how you found it challenging for yourself. Um. Well, it has been a journey and, and definitely one that I felt the Holy Spirit has been leading and participating in, and um, present in the midst of uh, it's humbling is uh, probably the biggest word humbling to, to realize that we live in the midst of and in the legacy of, of tremendous racial terror and violence that uh, I think one of the most powerful spiritual and, and moments of my life was when, when in, in the service of remembrance, when and in the apology moment, when Deborah, um, on behalf of the whole family, said, We speak your name, Austin Calloway, and forgive the ones who did this to you. I mean, just speaking the name just it just opened uh, opened something spiritually to yeah. say you know we we have broken the silence yeah. uh, and and it was so powerful to to hear that so um that's one i suppose just i i know in my own Heart and journey. I have witnessed Deborah and Bobby both live out the call to to Christian love. So I will never leave this. I, I won't leave this life without having seen the embodied 
spirit of, of Christ. Mm. Thank you. That is such an incredibly powerful testimony. Now, um, forgive me, who have we been joined by? So um, uh, I need an introduction here. This is Walter from... Um, Walter is um, another, mem another wonderful member of the Descendants um, who was so welcoming of me. And he's in the photographs, um, collecting the soil um, with, with Francis. And I'm thrilled that Walter's joined us. It's amazing, amazing. to see you, Walter. I yeah, didn't so, know you were going to join us. This is incredible. Well, thank you so much. I've been looking at your picture then in the cathedral. I didn't quite recognise you from this angle and with the baseball hat. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, so Walter, great. You're, on, you're on mute, Walter. Take yourself off mute so we can hear you. Okay. Oh, maybe That's it's amazing. Uh, uh, That's amazing. It, was that a surprise? Was that a surprise? It's legal and safe to do so. I think is the phrase <laughs> that we use in this uh, in this I know. country. <laughs> so, Deborah, was that a is that a surprise yeah, to get Walter on? I didn't know you were going. Walter was going to join us. That's amazing. So we've gone right into um, this sense of the presence of God. Okay, in, I'm back. I'm on now. Oh great. Okay. Walter, let's let's just hear. Say hello to Walter. That's really special that Walter's joined okay, us. Thank you. So tell us about the journey you're on at the minute, Walter. Well, uh, I'm um I'm now a pastor of a church and uh I'm just um uh been invited to come uh, be a part of this meeting so to kind of see what was going on with the Austin Callaway story. Okay. I'm thrilled to see you again, Walter. I don't know if you remember my face. You look a little different with the hair on your face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm so moved and uh, I'm so overwhelmed to see you and to see Deborah after such uh, incredible warmth of welcome and acceptance of me into your lives in 2017. It's, it's, um, it's wonderful to see you again. I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed. Yeah. Same to that's, you. That's really good. And your part in making all this real for us, Richard, has been so big. I'm going to ask Walter a question uh, just in case we lose him off the call, because that can happen sometime. So, Walter, I think if I'm right, did I see you with a kind of a trowel in your hand and with soil in it? Um, I don't know if that was actually your your yes. image there. I think it was. Yeah, that was so, me with that, the hair on my face. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So looking good, I have to say, in those pictures, but but also looking. Oh, I was trying to read your expression when I was looking at the at the photographs, and I was okay. just wondering what it what was in your mind and in your heart as you were gathering that soil. Well, it was nothing in particular. Was just. Uh being a part of what was taking place for us, the uh, uh, remembrance of uh, Officer Callaway, but, uh, you know, uh, it's something to think about when you uh, look back and see what all have taken place, and then you go into the, what's supposed to be the uh, original place where he was found, and then taking the saw for representation of uh, the place where he was left, left dead. It's such was, that the, a, was that the first time that you um, was it the first time you had visited the site, um, Walter? Exactly, that was the first time. Yeah. I thought so, and I think uh, we I, Walter and Francis and everyone allowed me to photograph them while they were in prayer, John. Wow. So exactly. yeah, I think the expression was very much of, of 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 contemplation in that moment. Yeah, yeah. I find it such a, in my conversation with Richard, uh, one of the email conversations. We, we were talking a little bit about, um, uh, if you'll allow me, um, blood and soil. Um, okay. There's something uh, so evocative about that and which also ties us into the sacrifice of Christ. Um, years ago, I remember... Um, Oh, I remember watching one of those classic TV movies about the um, about the life of Christ. I think it might have been The Robe or something like that. And there's a scene okay. in that with uh, of the crucifixion. You don't see Christ die, but what you see is the blood dripping on the ground below the cross and the rain. 
And actually, for me, that scene is always is always engraved on my heart because it was I was watching it on a Good Friday. And it was actually literally the day of the Good Friday peace agreement in Northern Ireland. And so there was this felt this image on screen of blood dripping into ground. And on the bottom of the screen was this banner thing that went across the screen that said peace agreement signed in Northern Ireland. And it was this um, bringing together of the fruits, I guess, of sacrifice, uh, but the reality of the cost of that. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I just wonder, is it too early to begin to look for any, any, I guess, redemption that may come from this death that happened? Is there anything, is there anything good that you could see coming from, well, certainly from the telling of the story, um, if, uh, if, if not from the, from the uncovering of the truth itself? Uh -huh. I don't know if either Deborah or Walter could speak to that. Um, I was just listening. And, uh, as far as that, you know, um, I can wonder if it's possible. That, uh, sorry, Deborah, do you want to just mute for a second while Walter's speaking, and then I'll come back specifically to you? If she wants to, she can go ahead in the car. So I'm getting out of my truck right now, All right, and I'm okay. going inside. She can go okay. ahead and speak. Deborah, why do you from, go, It'd be good to hear from you, Walter, though. Don't don't yeah. leave us. Yeah, no, oh, I'm not. Think so. No, he's not doing. Yeah, that's good. So what were you saying? So, Deborah, I guess I was just saying, um, is there anything, can you see anything good that can come particularly from the telling of this story? I think you've spoken of forgiveness. Is there anything which might speak more widely um, as this story is told, what good do you think that might lead to? In, in working on the story to do the remembrance service, what stuck with me was there was unity. Okay. Um, and that in his death, I think it brought unity. And I, would hope, I was hoping we would stay right there. I thought we were in a good place at that particular time. But of course, I've, other people, they started going in different directions. And they, I was surprised that they would leave such a beautiful thing that we, I felt like we had. So other people had other ideas and they left um, the family. Mm. They left uh, what we had built in a matter of months after the apology and it went, it traveled all over the world. Uh, it was as if though they felt like, well, we want to go in this direction. People wanted to take over. But I mm. think that Bobby and Wes and I still stood fast, stood fast and what we believe that we should focus on with his life and his story. This story belonged to Austin but what I felt belonged to the city of LaGrange was his death hmm. belonged to the city. I didn't feel like the, the family, they stayed with the family. They pulled hmm. away from the family. They wanted it to be the LaGrange story. So that in itself was division. And God wanted us to, I think, stay together. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, Bobby West and I have done that and they're still doing that, and will continually to do, continue to do that, is um, what I've seen with them. So I think that brought Wes and Bobby into my life, and um, that's what I gained from it, the unity that we share, the belief in Jesus. Wow. Thank you. I wanted to respect that as well in, in the fact that the... Uh, I focused entirely on Austin's life and on Austin's legacy as well. And I think that was just my instinct to do that and not make it a story about LaGrange and the bigger global story that overtook everything. And it's almost like Austin got lost in, in all of that. 
Thank you, Richard. And I think that seems to be what we have in the photographs in the cathedral. We've got something that's very intimate and it's very much focused on the family and what was going on. You haven't brought in any of the other wider stories and the media accounts. So, and that seems to me to be one of your gifts as a photographer that you're able to kind of help us to connect in a way with the people rather than necessarily the kind of public story uh, around it. Um, is that something which you aim to do particularly in your in your art? Um, um, it, it's it's not something that this that's particularly um, deliberate in any way. I have a I have a um, a need to make an intimate connection with people that I hope um, Deborah and Walter and and everyone who meets me feels that um, that I need to connect and 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 be as close as I can with people. And the camera helps me to do that. It always mm. has. Um, my background and I was adopted and, and all those things have really, and the cameras allowed me to, to see into other people's lives. And that's not a small thing. It's, it's, it's very real. So um, in, in, it, it gives me a, a safe way to connect in a very, what I feel is a very intimate way. So, and I hope that people can feel that when they're with me. And I felt like when I was with Walter and Deborah and everyone and Bobby in that, in that, um, in that moment, that I was present in that moment with them. I wasn't just some photographer from the outside, just documenting this thing that was happening just for whatever. But, and that's why I wanted to put this exhibition on Walter and Deborah. I wanted to fulfill that promise I made to myself and to you in 2017. It is remarkable. Can I, I, can I ask, I hope this doesn't seem like a, an inappropriate question, um, but for Walter and Deborah, to invite a white man to come in and photograph this very intimate moment, did that feel, I mean, um, did that raise any questions for you? Did it feel, was it, a, was it a kind of almost a step of faith to be ready to be okay about welcoming Richard in? Um, would you have preferred a black person or person of colour um, to be recording it? Or how did that play out for you? Walter, well, would you me, like to? Yeah. Well, for me, uh, uh, colour shouldn't have any barrier when you uh, can deal with someone and uh, judge them on their character. Because as a Christian, that's what we're supposed to do try the spirit by the spirit to know whether it's of God or not. And you'll find that in your uh, encounter with people, you're, you're connected with genuine people, and then sometimes uh, people that are around are not so genuine, even in the uh, purpose that you're in. And then uh, everybody have their own motives about what they do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so basically, yeah, I, I felt like uh, everything was being genuine and a concern about finding out the story of uh, Austin Callaway. But the point of it is, you know, you wonder, is it going to really get the justice that it deserved by uh, the way some of the people that's involved have turned this thing around to something different? And now you see it benefiting people uh, monetarily. Uh, and if anybody should get any monetary uh, blessing from it, it ought to be the Callaway family. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's really hard, isn't it? Uh, we might come back to that in a moment. Deborah, do you want to come in on that question of, of, of having Richard as a, uh, involved? When I first met Richard, the I think it was that Thursday night, he arrived here and he felt, I felt like he was genuine about what he was here to do. He was here to um, photograph and what he did, he really told the story in his photographs. And I think he succeeded in that. I didn't feel that it was a black white issue like we see a lot. And, um, you know, everybody understands looking at the physical, mm -hmm. you see black white. But mm -hmm. when you look at the heart uh, through God, you know, the eyes that God gives you as a Christian, you mm -hmm. see a different side of people. And I thought he was genuine. Now, I tell you the truth, I had been put through a lot with people want to come in, do commentaries and do stories. We never hear back from them and they are benefiting. So it was actually um, a benefit for some people. And I understood that.
But if you want to put a cost on a man's life, then that's something that you've got to deal with with God. So mm-hmm. I still keep pressing forward with what we set out to do, which is to tell his story and to um, get people to understand that this young man was murdered here. He was lynched by a mob that should have never happened, should have never happened. And for us to find out in such a way, it, it overwhelmed me. And as you study things, do you ever feel like you're back in 1940? That's the way I felt when it happened. I was living in 1940, but the only thing I could not place was a face of his. And so that overwhelmed me because I would like to see a face of his and I haven't been able to see that. So that's why I still move forward and communicate with Bobby a lot. We probably talk every week and we're working toward um, Austin. We're not working against what somebody else may do, because I tell Bobby all the time, God is going to handle that which is not right. And I don't have to worry about that. So my main concern is knowing that he came here and he told a story, a man I'd never seen before, um, taking pictures and they were beautiful. They told the story. And the one that had, um, of course, I say Walter, Walt, but him and my mom, every picture that he had of them was just beautiful. To me, it was beautiful. And I've shared it with everyone I can think, family, coworkers. I'm, I'm getting it out there, any means necessary. But um, I, think, I think he was genuine. And so when I did not hear back from him in from 2017, 2019, I ran across an email that I had received. And so I emailed, then I emailed the email I saw on there. Uh, I found his name and I kept looking, just went on, of course, Google, and I saw Richard Ansett. And I emailed the first email I ran across. And of course, we were put back together. And that was a blessing within itself. He didn't have to answer. I did answer. I did answer. And I think that that led to the amazing synchronicity of connecting to you. Right. John, and to the cathedral, and you already knew that connection, Deborah. Everybody, uh, you and uh, you already knew that um, Austin um, had died at the same time that Coventry was bombed. You you knew that synchronicity was there, which felt like a very Christian thing to me, that that, that connection was there. But again, it was such a struggle to make the connection and get anybody to notice, and especially because I decided to focus on Austin's life. I said to you when you've reached out to me, no one's interested, nobody cares. And then the cathedral, I feel very moved saying this, we contacted the cathedral and they cared and they said, yes, we, they just loved it. And they just, they really wanted to do something. So we're so grateful to them for allowing us to tell Austin's story, just Austin's story. I think we're we're so one of the things that really connects with us was just to come back to that to that um, that soil thing. Um, it's the there are things in the cathedral that we touch which connects us with our history, and one of them actually is a huge rock. We have a, our font in the cathedral in Coventry is a rock from the hillside uh, just outside Bethlehem. And it was brought over by land and sea to the cathedral by the builders in 1962 when the new cathedral was built. And when I bring people, and I can't remember if I did this with you, Richard, but I often get people to hang on to it, to hold it and to touch it, because to be connected through that sense of of something so physical and so visceral. Um, And I think the collection of soil connects you and in a sense me through your story back to those shocking events of 1940 and I think I was saying I think I was saying just before we came on the call I don't think I've said it already um, that um, uh, a few years ago when we had to do some uh, building work in the ruins of the old cathedral we had to dig down through the rubble through through the kind of existing the paving that's in the ruins of the old cathedral today to where the, the, the floor was in 1940. 
And it was the first time that had been uncovered really for 60 years. And uh, there in the, in the, uh, uh, on the kind of original floor were the, uh, rem still the remains of the ashes of the choir stalls that had been burnt in the fire of 1940. And so I was able to put my fingers into that, that, those ashes and pick them up. We used them a little bit of them on Ash Wednesday in the cathedral, but just to feel that sense of connection. And I think for us that connects us again in our Christian story uh, to crucifixion. So when the Dean of the cathedral, the provost as was then, uh, walked into the cathedral the day after the, 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 bomb, the bombing and the burning of the cathedral. He said, as I looked around, it felt to me as if we had shared in the crucifixion of Christ. But as I, as I recognized that, it came to me in a flash that just as we shared in his crucifixion, so we would also share in his resurrection. And I think for me, also in that in that moment, I guess the work of reconciliation was also born because the truth is you can't keep resurrection to yourself. It's not a personal, an individualistic thing. It's a it's a shared, it's a shared thing. If we're to be raised, that's something which we have to share with others. And I guess that's the narrative into which I hope we step with this story somehow of Austin, though in ways that are I can't quite explain. Whereas I'm going to come. Sorry, go on, Richard. Yeah. There was something about Deborah's. Deborah, you said something earlier about feeling like you were being transported back to 1940 and, and almost reliving that trauma again. And it's like that's been passed down because of the injustice. It's been passed on to us, yeah. and and it's affecting our our present. Does it, it's it's not a, it's a it's not an open question. But does it feel like that? Does it feel like that injustice is still infecting? The present. Yes, it does affect it. And, you know, and that's why I say it. If it was not for Jesus, it, it would be unbearable, I think. You know, you pray through it because and then I have to put it down and then I have to research a little bit more and put yeah. it down. Mm -hmm. I, I, I take myself through that because I know if I stay there, you know, I'll, uh, I'll be in 1940. You know, and I tried to imagine what it was like for him. That's my um, experience. I can not imagine what it felt like for him uh, to be taken from his home, you know, taken and, and placed in a cell and then taken out of there at night, I'm sure, by a masked man I, and, and tortured. And I cannot um, get over that part that's been the hardest part and uh, no justice came for him. And that's and so, unresolved, that's an unresolved. Right. Um, and the, the, of course the terror, his terror, but also the terror on the community, the terror that lynching creates for everyone. Yeah, because, um, when Bobby has tried to reach out to different people that might be around nine-ish that are still here and they don't want to talk about it. No, and I think not. some remember, but they choose not to talk about that, you know, in her experience of trying to get some questions answered. And I can understand. We were wondering about that. Me and John were talking about that idea about whether th something can be so horrible that maybe some people have to look away, Deborah, because it's just such a terrible thing. Or whether you, whether you think it's more ambivalence? Do you think it's more My understanding ambivalence? is... Some people that probably heard the story shared it with their families. They wanted their families to know. And I think that's just to protect them, to say, hey, this can happen. Mm -hmm. You know, it happened to this young man. It can happen to you. And it could happen to man or woman, as we know, you know, man, woman, or child mm -hmm. back then, you know. So 1940. So today. People are still um, afraid to talk about it. So as we help people talk about it, hopefully that there we can see a greater sense of justice today, because as it's surfaced, as you bring things into the light, then it is a way of hopefully changing that history in the present. Mm. 
Walter, you, uh, Walter had a, um, a, a colleague, a friend and pastor who was a, a descendant of the family that found Austin's body. Is that right, Walter? I think he was a, a pastor as well. Yeah, um, Mike Bowen. Mike, how's he, Mike? He was a classmate in the way. He well, Mike had moved uh, to another uh, state. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't have any connection with him right now, and I'm not uh, exactly sure where where he at now. But uh, uh, at that time, he, like I said, we was all together when we came together with that uh, breaking underground and you know getting that soil and everything and. Uh, and uh, one thing I did like to say is about uh, what you would like to not see is uh, that uh, Austin life would not be uh, in vain, you know. And if if what he had to deal with can enlighten some people and and, and put uh, people view in a different perspective and and thinking, because even now, you know, I sometimes wonder are we still in that that time frame because people are doing so many unseen things when it come to race. And so, you know, I even when I deal with people on my job, I never want to say anything about racism or anything like that. And I always use the word uh, uh, discrimination, but it all can fall in the same umbrella. But the point of it is, I try to get away from those things, but the more you try to get away from them, the more you see these things are, are showing their face again, you know. And when you see, or the Bible says, you know the tree by the fruit it bear, and you cannot go and look at people the way they act and not see whether they of God or not of God. So you just have to deal with it according to how your spirit of God would uh, lead you to do it. Because, and a lot of times it causes you to uh, bite your tongue in situation and uh, hold your peace because it really ain't breaking no kind of ground for it going in the right direction. I think the impact, the impact of the story, I'm going to come to you in a minute, Wes, just ask kind of where you feel, we, how you feel the story can be used. Just to come back to the cathedral again, um, uh, thinking about what you just said, Walter. Um, sometimes we say when we bring people to the cathedral to work on issues of reconciliation, we put people in a room to talk about their differences. And if they can't really resolve their differences, then we walk them out through the ruins of the cathedral. And we say, look, this is what happens if you can't resolve your differences. Um, you end up destroying not just buildings, but one another and lives. Uh, and then you get them to do some more talking. And if they still can't work it out, you walk them through the space again. And I guess that walking people through the story, uh, Austin's story um, and others, sadly like him um, uh, and obviously most recently the stories around George Floyd for example just is a way of confronting people with the outcome of them not being able to actually resolve properly their differences so I think that taking people through those stories even hard though it may be is is I think part of a journey of making things different we've got to do the work haven't we John yeah, yeah we have to do the work Wes, let me come to you. Um, uh, I mean, we'll probably, we've got about 10 minutes, I think probably then we ought to wrap up. Um, so I'll take some kind of, some sort of closing-ish reflections, but Wes, where, I mean, how do you feel, how, uh, how do you feel about where we are on this story that we've been sharing uh, just at the minute and what's next in terms of telling the story and, and what might come from it? Well, um, as Deborah said, it's an open-ended, um, inquiry it's still there's still many many things that we wish we knew and and we're trying to to leave it open so that people feel comfortable and and um and might share those their memories their stories their their family history with us um and feel unafraid i, I think one of the things i've come to know is that the what happened in in the lynching of an individual was that it it created this regime of fear and silence mm. that still carries over so that people were afraid to speak and the fear created silence and the silence created fear and the longer those things go together it's harder and harder to mm. to suddenly break that um 
that fear and silence. Um, so the, the white owned newspaper in, uh, in LaGrange never used the word lynching um, mm. in reference to Austin in 1940. And they had to be strongly persuaded to do it in 20, uh, in, around the events of really? uh, uh, remembrance because it was such a loaded word. And, and I think the, what we have, I think in a slow process, hopefully sort of allowed people to feel like there's a space to tell their stories without fear of repercussion or uh, it's a traumatic experience. So we wanna feel that people, when they do it, they feel supported and, and, and taken seriously. Um, so those things, so it is an ongoing journey. Uh, on a practical level, I can say that everything that all the documents and manuscripts and papers we're looking to, to try to get off of, um, off of my computer and, and, and sort of desk into a, a formal archival system. And we're, we'd very much like the story to be preserved and, and all the primary documents and, and recordings and, and when people do tell their stories, we can put them in a, in a place where future generations can have access to all of the, everything we found so that Austin is remembered and everything that he went through and his life um, that we've uncovered is there for posterity. Uh, and a second thing is we're looking, so we're looking for, for just practical help and, and ideas on how and where to do that. And then the second thing is we want to take the, the story itself and get it into a public. Uh, we have a manuscript and we have lots of the, the actual narrative. We want to get that into a, a, uh, an online portal type situation where that people where people can connect um, and learn it um, at their own speed and in a in a cult, in a curated way that, that's sensitive to the trauma and the violence that that, that entails. So it's not just um, hear the story and you don't have tools to process it. Um, so those are the two, two things that, that sort of where we hope to go uh, in, an, in sort of practical, um, practical ways and certainly appreciate any help anybody has on, on either of those ends. Um, so that's sort of the, I, I would echo what, uh, basically echo what, um, what Walter has said and what, what Deborah has said, that this is an open-ended thing and we want Austin's story to be um, remembered and respected. And, and, uh, and I think it will be. Thanks so much, Wes. Uh, Richard, let's come to you for, uh, for your comments. Then I'm gonna to come to Walter and Deborah before we finish. Well, I just, Briefly, I'd like to thank Deborah for reaching out to me um, and uh, reconnecting to me. And, it, and hopefully that um, I've kind of like um, lived up to their expectations. And, um, and if, you, if you hadn't reached out, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have, have been able to, to pull this off. And, so and and to bring his story to 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 Britain, so that the United Kingdom can have a a discussion about our own relationship to racial injustice and those legacies that have been passed on, not only to our our black family and our black brothers and sisters over here, but also the legacy of bystander guilt and uh, the perpetrator guilt that white people feel. Um, which is pre potentially preventing a lot of people in your community from coming forward and telling their story. Um, but there's a different story over here. And we wanted to make that connection to here and say, and talk about the idea of having that conversation in a different way. And also saying what lynching is. And I think what Les, is, uh, what Wes was saying was really important is that, how do you define a lynching? What, what, what qualifies as a terrorizing act that, that oppresses people through violence? Mm -hmm and hatred um, and I wanted to ask that question but the main thing was this incredibly and we touched on it earlier it's incredibly I'm incredibly touched by the 
I feel unworthy of the welcome and the and the love that you've shown me um, when I was there and and what I feel from you now. And I thank you for that. See, thank you, Richard. What an extraordinary conversation. Um, uh, and about trying to make this man whose face we don't even know uh, seen. And I don't know if you have an imagination, Deborah or Walter, of what his face was like, but wouldn't it be an extraordinary thing if somewhere, some, somehow a, a photograph emerges? But it seems that that is almost the heart of what's going on and how do we see each other anyway? Um, that seems to me so fundamental to the work of justice, being able to really see each other. Um, um, sorry, where it's gone. John, um, Bobby wanted to say something. I'm, oh, Bobby, sure, can you, you. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, uh, can you hear Bobby? Yeah, just about, go, go ahead, Bobby. Okay, go ahead, Bobby. And the lynching tree. I'm gonna say that again. The cross and the lynching tree. And what West contacted me, they wanted to um, have like a memorial or a pilgrimage or something to honor Austin because 75 years later, nothing had been done. And that was a very moving experience. Um, we went to the jail where he was taken, we went out to Liberty Hill. And I was just thrilled that someone thought enough to honor this young man 75 years later. And we stopped at a church, Midway Methodist Church, founded in 1861. And so when I look around and I saw the people, and I didn't have anything to say, but then I, but then I did. I saw myself very uh, sad. This came over me. And I began to pray and ask God to forgive those that did this to Austin. We know they've all got, they're all gone. Forgive the ones that knew about it and did nothing. And I felt that that Sunday evening, September 8th, 75 years later, that I consider it an honor to black African-American female. I said, Lord, we stand here today and we forgive what was done to Austin. I felt that I had a right to forgive, to forgive the shedding of the innocent blood. And that started that journey for me. So I think that's significant. It was, again, discovered in a book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. So we were able to be in a relationship with Dr. Cohn. And, uh, and to today, today, as we are moving into what's next, it's really, it really is about the cause. It's about but the victory of the cause. It's about the love. And that's what we're sharing with people now, the importance of forgiving and moving forward and working together to be in relationships today. Oh, thank you, Bobby. Thank you so much. And uh, that reference, the cross and the lynching tree, um, some of these even the titles feel hard just to just to say in 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 a casual way because that um it's it's sometimes we become so familiar with the stories of jesus death that 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 it kind of stops impacting us and so we touch the reality of that through the reality of other human deaths and things that people have experienced so um uh that's there's such an extraordinary um i guess uh source of healing that can come from that place of extreme pain um that i guess that's one of the things that we're trying to witness to so thank you and i'm sorry we weren't able to see your face bobby on the on the screen but thank you for being able to speak thank you wes for making that possible um Gosh, um, so many things still left to be said, I think, but but hopefully people will see the exhibition. The exhibition is on in the cathedral uh, for the whole of this month. Um, so Black History Month will continue to be shared and uh, Sarah will try and edit this a little bit just to try and make sure it flows and uh, make it possible for people to see on screen. And um, uh, now we've, we know we can kind of do it. We might maybe even try and do it again at some point. Um, but I wanted to come to Deborah and to Walter, maybe to have the last words this afternoon or this evening. And maybe if one of you might just say a blessing for us as well, that would be um, really appreciated at the end of this evening. 
So maybe Deborah, I come to you first. So I want to really um, first, not last, thank you for sharing this and we got the Zoom together. Mm. Um, and it's good we can see people in 2021, modern things yeah. with Zoom. Yeah. So I, but I, I don't take it lightly that you have this exhibit going on. I don't take it lightly at all. Mm. It takes a lot to put on and I know you've worked hard to get it where it is today. Mm. And the work is beautiful. And I think God is proud. Mm. He's glorified in what, what you have done. Mm. And I, I um, really appreciate it. Um, appreciate the hard work because it's, it's not easy when you're trying to tell a story mm. and, and give it meaning. It's, it's not easy. So I don't take that lightly. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart from LaGrange, Georgia. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Mm -hmm. That's so lovely. I hope you take that, Richard. Um, Walter, let's come to you. Okay. Um, yeah, I, um, I also appreciate everything that has been done and just hope that uh, as it continues to be shared that someone can get something positive from it, even in what bad have taken place, but hopefully it, it could uh, build a, a better relationship with uh, races of people that we can learn to do better as we live day to day. Uh, other than that, I just can take one day at a time and hope that whatever the purpose that God have for what he have done, that uh, things will go in that uh, respected place and uh, and if you uh, like to bow your heads, I, I close us out with prayer. Mm -hmm. Our Father God in heaven, we come once again thanking you for your many blessings. Lord, we thank you today for this fellowship across the nations. We thank you, Lord, that the life of Officer Callaway is moving forward, that people can learn from what have taken place through our generation that we have lived, that have lived before us, and even some that reflect back of the lives that we live this day. But we pray, Lord, that you will continue to bless us all as you see fit. Continue to do what you said in the word, that you'll order our steps, for the steps of a good man is ordered by God. We know everybody means well, but everybody's not good. But we just ask, Lord, that you would just create in us all a clean heart and renew the right spirit on the inside. We thank and praise you for this day. And we pray, Lord, that you continue to allow us as you see fit that if we come together again, that everything will work out for the good. As you say, let our light shine that the world may see your good work in us and give you the glory in heaven. We thank and praise you for that alone. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, what, a, what an extraordinary conversation. And um, I can't believe we're all in each other's rooms and cars. And um, uh, thank you. Look <laughs> at you, Richard. <laughs> it's just been so moving. And um, I'm, I'm the last one to come to this particular conversation. So I'm uh, freshly grateful for it. Uh, thank you for your graciousness. Thank you for all that you brought to this piece of storytelling and may um, the name of Austin Calloway go forward and his face be discovered, found and shared. Okay. <laughs>